Welcome back. Normally, high-speed rail is always on time. So we're going to start our last panel on time. And um, we will be discussing a, a key question for high-speed rail in California. Is it viable? As the eighth largest economy in the world, a major producer of technology, entertainment, and agriculture, California is a major global player. But will high-speed rail work in our great state? To help us answer some of these questions, we have a star-studded panel. Uh, it's a big panel. And uh, Sean Rold Randolph, President and CEO of the um, Economic Bay Area Council Economics, uh, Economic Institute, will be moderating this panel. Thank you very much, Blas, and welcome to our afternoon session. Uh, if I'm a little bit more disoriented than I usually might be, it's because I got off a, an airplane at SFO last night around midnight after about 20 hours of flying. So I'm a little disoriented at the moment, but uh, A, I didn't want to miss the conference, and B, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to engage in this panel, because A, it's a terrific panel, but it's an extremely important topic, and for us here in the Bay Area, for us here in California, uh, the economics of high-speed rail uh, and the business model and the proposition for what it will do or could do for our economy in the Bay Area, LA, and throughout the state is extremely important, and we couldn't have a better group this morning to be discussing it. I, I was also really struck by this group coming together because last summer I, I had the chance to be just touring around as a visitor in France, and we were driving around from southern France. We're headed toward Paris, and we were up in the Loire Valley and thought, well, we could drive into Paris and dump our car at a parking lot somewhere in the city, and we're going to fly out a day afterward, and we'd have to you know, drive through traffic, and we'd have to find a garage, and God knows what to do in Paris with that. So why don't we just look for a train station and uh, take the train from Tours, which is a good-sized city nearby. So we did that. Never been on high-speed rail in France before. And uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, we drove up, and there was the rental agency next door, and you walk across about 50 feet, and there's a high-speed rail station, and you got on the train, and uh, exactly one hour later, we were in downtown Paris getting off at uh, a central station. It would have taken us probably three hours or more to struggle through traffic. Uh, and then I looked in the back of the, uh, the ticket sleeve that, wow, this thing goes everywhere. We could have gone anywhere in France in not much longer than I thought, wow, and where are we in California, the state that leads uh, the world, presumably, in innovation? Uh, so evidently not in all things. Uh, and there's a, a lesson there uh, for us, perhaps, in the opportunities as well as some of the issues ahead as we try to get this implemented here in California. So the, the group we have for our panel day is, is extraordinary. I hope you've had the chance to look at their resumes because they're really long and they're really rich and, uh, and very impressive. I'll just introduce each one with a sentence or two of introduction. Uh, and afterward, we'll invite each one to speak for about 10 minutes, maybe 15, but 10 is great. And then we're going to open it up to your questions, and there'll be little question cards that'll be passed around. And if you just pass those up here as questions occur to you, we'll have some time at the end of the session for the Q&A. Uh, so in order in which they'll be speaking, uh, we've got uh, Maria Ayerdi Kaplan, who's the executive director of the Transbay Joint Powers Authority in San Francisco. Uh, it's a, a $4.2 billion project. Uh, often referred to as the Grand Central Station of the West. And uh, it is actually the first high-speed rail project to break ground in the United States, which is quite a distinction. So uh, the authority is way out there in a the leadership position nationally and, and here in the state. And a lot of that credit goes to, to Maria. Uh, we're going to hear then from Don Sepulveda. We're going to move down to Southern California and LA. He's the executive officer for regional rail for the LA County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Uh, and he leads the team there responsible for high-speed rail in Los Angeles County. Uh, and of course, the LA San Diego route is the core route in the system we're talking about. Uh, moving back up here to the northern end of the system, the San Francisco, uh, we'll hear from Jim Lazarus. He's been with the San Francisco Chamber since 2006, Senior Vice President for Public Policy. Uh, and he's held a, quite a range of senior positions, including working 
for former mayors of San Francisco, uh, Diane Feinstein and Frank Jordan, including being deputy mayor and uh, chief of staff. So he brings a great San Francisco perspective, and now we're going to pop it out after Jim uh, to a much broader transportation perspective, and we're really privileged to have Rod Deridon with us. And Rod is the director of the Mineta Transportation Institute based out of San Jose. Uh, he has been uh, on the board, appointed by Governors Davis and Schwarzenegger of the High Speed Rail Authority, uh, and where he is chair emeritus. So he can give a, a perspective from uh, inside the authority. Uh, then we'll have uh, Dennis Dute. Did I say Dute or Dute? Dute. Dute, great. Uh, who is uh, CEO of SNCF America. Uh, he's been working with them for quite a few years. Uh, and with, uh, well, 30 years to be exact, so I guess that counts as quite a few years, uh, including a four-year assignment in rail engineering here in the U.S. Uh, and the highlight of his activities, as you'll see from his bio here in the U.S., has been his involvement in the Texas High Speed Rail Project, where he was in charge of all the technical aspects. And he has a range of other experience in terms of what's happened in Florida and also uh, the East Coast Corridor. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Donna Andrews, who's the president and CEO of the Lee Andrews Group, uh, based out of LA. And they, their firm provides technology, environmental, and public affairs consulting services uh, to large-scale public-private partnerships such as this. And they've been working on areas of environmental mitigation, uh, land use development, and similar issues. So as you can see, we've got a geographic range here with us in the panel a range of expertise representing transportation broadly, uh, key cities, uh, transportation operator, and I think you'll all come away with a great perspective on the issue. So keep your questions in mind as we go forward, uh, jot them down, uh, they'll come up here and we'll have some time for conversations in the end. So we'll start with the Maria. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the Center for Environmental Public Policy for having us here today and thank all of you for joining us. Uh, the Transway Joint Powers Authority is a regional state entity whose mission is to build, design, and operate the new Transway Transit Center, which is located in downtown San Francisco. How many of you are familiar with the project? Oh, it sounds like quite a bit. That's good. Uh, well, then, as you know, the project is uh, a $4.2 billion project. It occupies about four city blocks. It's going to uh, accommodate uh, the nine barrier counties, uh, bus operations, as well as San Francisco's. Also, it will accommodate Caltrain commuter rail, California's high-speed rail, as well as Amtrak. It is also being designed to accommodate uh, Amtrak if the region were to so choose to bring Amtrak in, uh, such as the coast daylight from Southern California. In addition, the station's being designed so that if we wanted to continue the rail through a parallel underwater tube um, to the current BART tunnel to the East Bay, we could do that as well. So we've taken everything into account in designing this station that should last for the next uh, coming generation and beyond. What we're gonna do is we're gonna show a video that'll give you more of a context for the project. The status currently of the project is that we are in construction. We've started phase one of the building, which is, uh, includes building the underground rail levels as well as the above superstructure. Uh, we expect to have that completed by 2017. Uh, we're um, fully environmentally cleared. We're also in the process of, of looking for the rest of the funding that we need to bring the rail from the current terminus for Caltrain, which is at 4th and Townsend, directly into the new station. Uh, and once we have the rest of that funding, we can start construction. We're about beyond 30% on the engineering design for the rail component. So if we were able to locate the, the rest of the funding that we need, which is about $2 billion, we could start construction in 2012 and have that completed by 2019. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'll just, uh, if the tech person could please start the video. Thank you. The former Transbay Terminal, located at First and Mission Streets, just one block south of San Francisco's Market Street, was built in the depths of the Great Depression as a sign of hope for the future. It's being replaced with a new optimistic expression for our future, a new multimodal transit center that is modern, efficient, and graceful. The old Transbay Terminal building was built in 1936 and paid for with bridge tolls. At the time, the lower deck of the Bay Bridge had electrified tracks and trains that ran from San Francisco to the East Bay and Sacramento. 
They were operated by companies with romantic names like the Interurban Electric, the Sacramento Northern, and of course, the Key System. In 1946, at the heyday of rail transport in the United States, 26 million people used the Transbay Terminal each year. Following World War II, the automobile became king. When the tracks were removed from the lower deck of the Bay Bridge in 1958, the Transbay Terminal was converted to a bus-only facility. The former Transbay Terminal had the highest transit connectivity in the region. Its main tenant was AC Transit. It also served Muni service throughout San Francisco, Samtran service to the peninsula, Golden Gate Transit to Marin County, Greyhound service connecting passengers throughout the United States, paratransit service for the disabled, and many others. However, the facility did not meet current or future transit operating needs or the growing commuter workforce in the Bay Area and the state of California. To bring back the glory of the original terminal and plan for a more sustainable future where people are not dependent on the automobile, the Transbay Joint Powers Authority is building a new multimodal transit center in two construction phases. The first phase includes building the new transit center designed by Cesar Pelli and Fred Clark of Pelli Clark Pelli Architects. It also includes the construction and operation of a temporary terminal for the current operators to use while the new station is under construction. A bus storage facility for midday parking of AC transit buses will also be built under the west span of the Bay Bridge. In the second phase, the Caltran rail line will be extended 1.3 miles under Townsend and 2nd Street from its current terminus at 4th and Townsend directly into the new station. This line will also serve California high-speed rail. While the station is located in San Francisco, it has connections to the nine Bay Area counties and 11 different transit operators, including a new high-speed rail from Southern California. The Transbay Terminal redevelopment will bring new housing to a new neighborhood with seven high-rise buildings built on former freeway lands owned by the state. The land is being transferred to San Francisco and the Transbay Joint Powers Authority for the purpose of building the new transit center, the new high-rise residential buildings, and a new office tower. The proposed 1,000-foot transit tower neighboring the transit center will bring many jobs to the area. The new LEED Gold Transit Center is five levels, including two underground levels. The deepest level handles Caltrain commuter trains and intercity high-speed rail. The lower concourse level includes passenger waiting and ticketing, as well as retail activities. On the street level, Muni buses board passengers quickly in a completely weather-protected area. Muni is right across the street from the Grand Hall, the primary public entry to the transit center, where passengers will stream to the trains downstairs and the buses upstairs. On the street level, at the west end of the terminal, there's additional circulation to the trains and buses, as well as retail and other service functions. The mezzanine level will have more retail, office spaces, and intercity bus operations. The bus deck level provides an elevated waiting area for Transbay bus passengers with a dedicated connection to the Bay Bridge. The station itself is about a million gross square feet, four city blocks long, and capping all this is a new 5.4 acre park. The park, designed by Peter Walker and partners, will feature a children's playground as well as art, cultural, and educational activities. There's also a music amphitheater. The park will feature a water fountain designed by the artist Ned Kahn. The vision is for the park to accommodate the people who live in the neighborhood, that work in the area, and that come into San Francisco as transit riders connecting to various parts of the Bay Area and eventually the entire state of California. Today, Natoma Street is one of the most blighted areas of the Transbay Redevelopment Area. Yet, in the not-too-distant future, it will be a true destination for both residents and visitors of San Francisco alike, with wide sidewalks, 
retail, coffee shops, and other commercial activities similar to what you see at Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Mission Plaza will be shared by both the transit tower and the new station. The current design features redwood trees, California's own state tree reaching upward towards the plaza's canopy above. An exciting feature that has been proposed by the architect Cesar Pelli is a funicular as one of the ways to access the rooftop park. The Mission Plaza leads into the Grand Hall, the ground level of the new transit center. The hall is a very light and open space which welcomes the public to the regional and statewide transit system. It features a terrazzo floor designed by San Francisco artist Julie Chang, incorporating iconic images of California poppies. An impressive oculus brings light into the Grand Hall and serves as both an aesthetic feature as well as an element of the building's structure. On the bus deck level, passengers will be greeted by a permanent LED sign installation designed by artist Jenny Holzer. AC Transit, Greyhound, Western Contra Costa, Muni Treasure Island buses, and Amtrak shuttle buses will operate in this light and modern facility. A very different experience than what was available at the former Transbay Terminal. California High Speed Rail is an important component of the Transbay project. The TJPA is designing a station in accordance with state law and the local referendum that accommodates future high-speed rail operations from Southern California. The high-speed trains will operate on the Caltrain corridor from San Jose into San Francisco. At 7th Street in San Francisco, the tracks will be in a new tunnel, connecting to a new underground station at 4th and Townsend, and then continue in a mile-plus long underground tunnel under 2nd Street. Both Caltrain electric trains and Los Angeles-bound high-speed trains will use the tunnel into the Transbay Transit Center. The underground rail levels will be light and welcoming. Once the trains enter the underground level of the new station, passengers will be greeted by the Transit Center in the new heart of downtown San Francisco. From the new station, passengers will have access to quick and easy connections to buses that will allow them to get to all other points in the Bay Area. The TJPA's vision is a safe, efficient, convenient, seamless station surrounded by the densest and most beautiful urban neighborhood in the Bay Area. This vibrant new neighborhood will include seven residential towers within the Transbay Redevelopment Area. This redevelopment not only helps fund the new transit center, it brings a new neighborhood south of Market Street to life. Today, Folsom Street has chain link fences and narrow sidewalks. In the future, it will be a boulevard with views to the bay, wide sidewalks and landscaping. Neighbors will be able to sit at outdoor cafes and stroll along the sidewalks. Once the temporary terminal closes, the site will be transformed into a one-acre park and 762 new residential units by the Redevelopment Agency. This park will be an open community space for the new Transbay neighborhood, where people can play frisbee and walk their dog. This visionary transportation and housing project will transform a downtown area opened up by the removal of the Embarcadero Freeway and return the San Francisco Bay Area and the state of California to a culture of mass transit. Thanks, Maria. So that's the northern end, mm -hmm. and we're going to hear now from Don Sepulveda about how it looks from Los Angeles. Oh, oh. We went blank. Disorient. Like there we are. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. I was sitting there. I, I apologize, Maria. I had to turn around. I had to stop watching it because I was actually getting carsick up there watching the video. It, it, it was that real at some points. That's, a, that's quite the project. 
Um, the, uh, I'm coming from Los Angeles, of course, and uh, speaking my new role, I've actually been on this position for a month. I was on the consulting side up for uh, a number of years before coming into the public arena. So this is my first adventure in there, and it's been a, an exciting ride, so to speak. Uh, I did want to talk to you about uh, what we see as high-speed rail in California, and in particular, and how it relates to Los Angeles. And when you listen to me talk, uh, remember that I am an engineer. I, I've been working with high-speed rail since 95 on the original statewide study. And, uh, and so I've got this perspective as an engineer as moving forward. So bear that in mind as you, as you hear what I have to say in certain cases. Because I've seen what works and what doesn't work when you don't do things properly. So you've all seen this picture before. This is the map of, uh, and by the way, I promise I will only use the laser pointer a little bit. Uh, this is the, the straightforward state map that we see, and this map actually defines the intent of the high-speed rail, high rail system. It is to join the population centers, and it is to provide a regional, multi-regional connectivity throughout, Los, uh, throughout California through rail, which frankly we do not have at this moment, and it does so efficiently. So we think of Los Angeles and high-speed rail corridors. This is where we are, and excuse me, there we go. We have, coming from the Palmdale segment, that's Palmdale Station, coming down through the Santa Clarita Valley out through here, San Fernando Valley into Union Station. And one thing you'll hear me say about LA Union Station, it, it is our Rome. You've heard the story of all things, all roads meet at Rome. This is us for, in Southern California. And as much of our regional network works in California, or Southern California and Los Angeles, as does high-speed rail, it is a terminus point, but from that point, we connect up to the segment of LA to Palmdale, we connect to San Diego through the Inland Empire, we connect to Anaheim down the Los San Corridor. And what this means is it connects to our existing regional rail connections, including Amtrak and Metrolink. Out there, we have Metrolink, that runs on 450 track miles out in the Southern California age area through the six counties in, Los, in, uh, in Southern California, and that includes San Diego. And what this does is this connects us and provides a true multimodal type of connection for us. And when you put it in perspective, that's Union Station again. Again, that's out to Palmdale. These are the various lines coming in, and this is, you follow the red line all the way down, that is what we call the Los Angeles Corridor, the Los Angeles to San Diego Corridor there, that actually runs Amtrak service and runs a lot of our other commuter rail lines there. So as we, we start thinking about how this all breaks out into our regional connectivity in Los Angeles, this, this is essentially our roadmap of Rome, if you will. And all the black lines you see are funded projects. Out here in Southern California, we have that wonderful measure called Measure R. Has anybody ever heard of it? That's our sales tax measure that uh, passed at the same time as 1B passed, or 1A, excuse me, and uh, at the same time our president was elected. And that has a half cent sales tax, and what that did is it provided funding for us to do a lot of regional trans, provide a lot of regional transportation solutions for our constituency in the Los Angeles County and various projects. And you'll see a number of those on there. Of course, you've all heard about the Subway to the Sea. The Subway to the Sea is the banner project. We have a new, number of other transit rail projects. Uh, that this funds, including positive train control and other Metrolink projects. And all of that is designed to enhance our interconnectivity. And when you think about Los Angeles and how Los Angeles works, and Los Angeles has always been a hub, if you will. At, it, when Los Angeles was developed and downtown Los Angeles was developed, we had our central city. People would come into the city to do their shopping, to do their, their, uh, the, buy their produce and vegetables. They'd go to the music houses, then they'd go back home to the suburbs. Right now, it is too expensive to live in the Los Angeles area, so now they live out in the suburbs. They live out in these outlying counties, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, Ventura County, and some of those things, and they commute into Los Angeles, so we are truly a hub type of mentality. 
And give you a, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of spe uh, specific statistics, even though I am an engineer and we tend to do that, uh, I tend to look at things a little bit differently. We do have about 9.8 million people in Los Angeles County. We are the most popular in the state, populous in the state, about 4,100 square miles. We actually, in Southern California, including San Diego in this part discussion now, has about 50% of the state jobs. Our gross product is about $1.8 billion. That's a whole lot of zeros. At the same time, though, we are blessed, unfortunately, with an unemployment rate of 12.4%. And uh, this has, uh, and, and one thing about unemployment statistics is they, they tend to, from my, my uh, uh, information gathering, is they tend to uh, not count certain people that have just basically stopped looking for jobs. So I, in reality, I think that number is actually a bit higher, which is really scary for us in, in Los Angeles County. As you know, like everybody else, we took the property hit, and things are just not quite coming up that quickly. So what does high-speed rail do to us? Oh, one other thing. I forgot to tell you. Yeah, there, there it is right there. What does high-speed rail do to us? Uh, High-speed rail actually gives us that regional connection for the success of the statewide system. If you look at the ridership numbers, whether you agree or disagree is irrelevant here. But when you look at the ridership numbers, the fact is plain and simple. When you connect Los Angeles, when you connect the Bay Area, your ridership goes up. That's the, that's the fact of it. So we've got to think about that as we start moving forward in this and understand that the voters of these two areas voted for that proposition to get this thing moving forward. So we, in Los Angeles County, we have about, in just Los Angeles County, 40,000 trips daily that can originate in Los Angeles. And at the same time, it provides access to 24 of the Fortune 1000 companies. That includes Walt Disney and several others. At the same time, it also provides some additional connections to three of the county's air, uh, airports. So what does transit system expansion do? And, and some of the things that uh, I, I really wanted to mention home, because you're going to hear something from me that you don't necessarily hear a lot, and, and I really want to emphasize this, and that is partnership, partnering with the communities, partnering with the agencies, and partnering with the people along the way. Frankly. No, no system will work that way if you don't do that. Uh, as an engineer, I found out a long time ago that if you don't meet with the people and understand what makes them tick, frankly, they're not going to support your project. And the last thing you need is somebody not supporting your project. So it involves partnership. But proper expansion increases that mobility and connectivity to the prim primary destinations. You find out those destinations through partnership. It improves the community linkages. It improves that jobs and housing balance that, you, that, that is so important for us. We have uh, at various uh, measures out there that we're trying to, uh, all of us are trying to work with, AB 32, SB 375, and several others that are in the mix. We have the potential now with high-speed rail and various other transit links to reduce vehicle use. And we all know reducing vehicle use, especially coming from Los Angeles, it reduces congestion and it reduces the air pollution. Uh, so it, it's all of these little issues come into play as we, as we move forward. So what are we doing in Los Angeles? We are partnering to consolidate regional rail transportation. In our Los Angeles corridor, we have three different railroads functioning, Metrolink, NCTD, uh, North County Transit District and Amtrak, all vying for the same rails. And frankly, this is where we're going to put high-speed rail between Los Angeles and Anaheim. So what we're doing is we're working to consolidate these works. It's uh, getting everybody on the same page so that can, we, can, we can basically consolidate things and move our projects forward and, and set an example for our constituency that we're there to make it work for them. We also purchased LA Union Station. And we're embarking on this master plan to incorporate that with the urban fabric of downtown Los Angeles and incorporate that into the high-speed high rail network and our regional transportation network. We passed our Measure R fund, which I talked about a moment ago. And our Measure R fund, and frankly, it expands our connectivity. It, it, co it completes many of the spokes on the transit hub that we've been working on. And it, frankly, builds a lot of the old red car back in that, that was taken out so long ago. So when we talk about partnering for success, the old adage of, you know, if you build it, they will come, doesn't necessarily work. 
what we need to do is we need to work with the agent, work with our local folks to make sure we're giving them what they need and what they want. And this is not to say that we're myopic and just looking at that one segment, but we've got to look to the future of where they're going, what their long-range planning plans are, and if they don't have any long-range plans, what can we do to reach into these communities and help them develop some sort of long-range planning to make this a success? Station planning also includes business development. We're not just talking about micro-business and hot dog stands. We're talking about office buildings. We're talking about building business that can actually use the transit system to get to where they're going. We talked a moment about the Fortune 24, or Fortune 1000, the 24 of them. Incorporating them into our system so that they can now have an easy access to the train to get to San Francisco to do business. Proper planning and solutions, of course, is it encourages that local transit use, regional connections, using other modes, making sure that you've got the buses working so that the buses aren't leaving before the train gets there. Yes, that does happen all too often. So we talk about briefly on, the, on job opportunities. We've all heard this, about 19,000 job months per one billion in investment. But we've got to remember that those are not just short-term construction jobs. Those are long-term opportunities for training and job placement and career development, not just for the person that's swinging the hammer, but for the person that's drawing the plans. So we've got to think about these things as we move it forward in this economy that's, that's struggling to get back on its feet. And what has very, been very successful in a number of projects, and bear in mind, I worked on the Alameda Corridor, so I've seen successful projects, a jobs training program that actually is required as these projects move forward for your design build contractor goes a long way to increasing pride, increasing pride in your community, because now you're reaching in the community for those that are helping to build the system. And it works. It's a system that works, and it works well. High-speed rail can provide, of course, opportunities for economic development. Uh, we heard earlier that high-speed rail in and of itself will not create jobs and it will not build an economy. But what it does do is it provides the opportunity by creating that connectivity that's very important for all of us as we, as we move from place to place. The world is a very much smaller place these days. We've got the internet, we've got video teleconferencing, but frankly, all of that stuff doesn't work all the time. You've, sometimes you just have to get to, to uh, Berkeley and give a presentation. Uh, jobs creation, skilled labor development, I mentioned those a moment ago. Regional connectivity to statewide resources. I would love to have one of my folks, uh, and my, when I say my folks, I mean my constituencies in, LA, in LA County, Get on a red uh, on a on a uh, orange line bus BRT bus, take it to a red line uh, a station in North Hollywood, ride the train into Union Station, jump on a high speed rail train and go to San Francisco. How is that? Not has, doesn't even have to get into a car. You just can't beat that. So we've got to we think about these things. And you're going to hear me say sustainable and and uh, but sustainable is more than just uh, uh, that touchy-feely stuff we all hear over and over again. Sustainability is more of we, we, we can only build what we use, and we, can, we have to use what we build. So we have to build things so that they are useful. And as an engineer, there is nothing worse than, uh, and I'll say this, and Patton used to say this as well, paying for the same real estate twice. We've all heard it where things have had to be redone, and it frankly happens when people don't listen to other people. And I know I'm going to get a little controversial here, but we have to have those partnerships in moving forward, and we have to listen to everybody in order to come up with the right solutions that meet the needs of the people who are actually using this and not the needs of the engineers who are designing it. We've got to come to a happy medium between the two. And when one doesn't talk to the other, we get paying for the same real estate twice. And, of course, always redevelopment areas at transit, uh, transportation centers, looking for that opportunity for redevelopment. We talked about, Maria showed that great video of the Trans Bay and how you're redeveloping that area and bringing that, that 
area back to life. There's nothing more exciting than being able to do that and being able to do that with a transportation center that not only brings people in from the outlying areas, but shows them the excitement of the city life and what can be happening in the city life. And uh, with that, I thank you. Thanks very much, Don. So we'll hear now from Jim Lazarus. Thank you, and thank uh, UC for hosting this. Uh, I was here on the campus in 2008 during the Prop 1A campaign when uh, this was really a, a, a lot of leadership came out of this community uh, for the Bay Area's effort uh, on behalf of that ballot measure for high-speed rail. You know, from a business community point of view, uh, you have to kind of stop for a second and, and think back, uh, if you're as old as I am, about what California once was when growing up in the 1950s in this state, before there was a completed highway system. I can remember when highways were not congested, the congestion was where the highways stopped. And when you had to go to Tahoe through downtown Sacramento or something, 80 was fine. It's where 80 stopped that was the problem. Now it's congested all the way with or without. Where we had an airport, San Francisco just uh, reopened Terminal 2, the old Central Terminal. The original, well, not the original, the 1954 modern airport for San Francisco that accommodated all of San Francisco's and most of the Bay Area's air traffic in that 1954 building. Closed a few years ago when the new International Terminal was built, actually closed about 10 years ago, just reopened, beautiful facility, a rebuilt, LEED certified 1954 renovated building occupies, occupied by two airlines. So where, where have we grown and how do, where are we going to go when we were a state of, you know, uh, 200 years ago of a couple hundred thousand people in the entire state of California to uh, the early 1960s when we passed New York as the most populous state at 11 or 12 million. Now 37 million projected to be 50 million people. We can't operate with those same airports and the same highways and the same infrastructure in the state, uh, but we're also unable to build our way out of it through more highways, more filling of the bay for airports, or, or going into neighborhoods to demolish them to make runway capacity. So from a business point of view, um, it's the cost of congestion, it's the unacceptable delays in transportation of people and uh, goods, and it's the population growth that's projected to come over the next 20 years that really made us believe in San Francisco and take the message out to business organizations around the state of the need for another 21st century transportation opportunity, and that's high-speed rail. Uh, you can read up here what, 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 and I'm sure you've heard it over the last two days, the benefits of high-speed rail to this state in terms of removing traffic from highways, uh, providing alternatives, especially uh, for the Central Valley to Bay Area and Central Valley to Los Angeles routes, meet greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, and encourage transit-oriented growth along those high-speed rail corridors, and faster commute options for distant bedroom communities to come to the job centers of the Bay Area and the Los Angeles Basin. Um, you're not, well, it's not, it didn't come out too well. This is actually a list of, a partial list of supporters from 2008 of high-speed rail. And what it shows in its uh, bad copy is a number of business organizations, most along the corridor, from the Bay Area, through the Central Valley, up to Sacramento, down to Los Angeles and Anaheim. It's a little light down to San Diego and over to San Bernardino and Riverside because they weren't sure the train was ever going to get there. Uh, but those along the main spine signed up uh, in 2008, as well as a partial list of labor unions and environmental groups. It was one of those rare opportunities of a merge of a business, labor, and environmental coalition uh, that saw the need for this option for California, one that has been kicked around for many, many years. I have a 1996 executive copy of a state report. Rod was telling me there was actually one prior to that. Uh, and then, of course, the work that came out of the California High-Speed Rail Authority that led to Prop 1A in, in 2008. Um, materials that came out of that campaign 
600,000 construction-related jobs uh, to build the core system and then the operational and maintenance jobs once the system is up and going. Uh, the San Francisco segment, 105,000, San Francisco, San Jose, 105,000 jobs. Palmdale, LA, 125,000 jobs uh, as it's built in segments throughout the state. So a, tr a tremendous opportunity to jumpstart, uh, especially the construction industry in this state. Um, one of the other pieces of material that we kind of forget about, this is one of the largest earth-moving tunnel and bridge construction projects in the history of the state of California, and probably in the history of the United States. Uh, maybe if you figure the entire build out of the interstate highway system, that might be a right up there, but 215 million cubic yards of earthwork, 9.2 million cubic yards of concrete, 4.5 million tons of steel, 1,600 miles of track, 2,400 miles of electrical and communication cables, 126,000 on-site construction jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, key to uh, the immediate economic recovery and a key, of course, to the long-term growth of the state's economy and this is a segment of uh, the 6,000 operational jobs that would be created by the High Speed Rail Authority's private partner in operating the system. Sean uh, remembers this cover. In 2008, uh, the Bay Area Economic Council uh, Economic Institute was asked to do a report on the impacts in the Bay Area, and there probably was a version of this in Southern California as well. Uh, really going to the validity of the business plan and, and what we could count on to come out of, uh, out of high-speed rail for the residents and businesses of California. Uh, that report said for the Bay Area, 6.9 to 8.9 billion dollars of construction spending, 100,000 to 128,000 Bay Area jobs, a 1.1 percent increase in permanent employment by the time the system is built out, a more efficient way of accessing a regional workforce for Bay Area employers, uh, upgraded uh, uh, Caltrain commute service during the, in the existing corridor from Gilroy to San Jose to San Francisco. Uh, very importantly, the reallocation of airport capacity to long-haul international and transcontinental flights rather than expensive, costly, uh, small capacity flights intra-state in California. And of course, I think most importantly, connecting Northern and Southern California uh, business centers. Uh, just like jet aircraft, just like the interstate highway system, high-speed rail is really gonna change the way we live, the way we do business uh, as a state. Uh, it's gonna make, uh, it, it, you don't even think about the concept of perhaps uh, you know, going down to a meeting uh, for a couple of hours by train, or going to a giant Dodger game in one of the other cities for the day and not spending the night or not have to, to deal with hours and hours on both ends of, of airport situations to, to make those trips. So this is uh, clearly, in our mind, uh, a great opportunity for the state, one that is gonna require, over the next 18 months, some really smart politics to bring together uh, communities of interest. It's not just issues uh, that we hear about in the peninsula of concerns about how this system's gonna be built out, but where it turns in the Central Valley to go west, issues between Anaheim and Los Angeles and that right away. Uh, any major construction project in this day and age is gonna have uh, heightened community interest and involvement, but I think we can work through those, those issues because of the benefit that will come to the next generation if we do the right thing here in the next year or two. So thank you, look forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Jim. Next up, Rod Derrida. I uh, first want to thank uh, Sean for the nice uh, introduction earlier, and uh, uh, Blas and uh, UC Policy Institute, thank you for bringing us together, and especially thank you for hosting the video later so that people can go to your website and, and see this. I think the people that are here are are the tip of the iceberg, but those that will see what you're preparing and what you're communicating uh, will help uh, this project and help people to make a, a, an informed decision about the project, and that's a great credit to you and to UC. I don't think I have to convince anyone here of the need for high-speed rail. 
Uh, you, you've heard, uh, I'm sorry? Well, oh, well, uh, you go sit out here now. <laughs> Uh, but I really don't believe that after uh, two days, if any uh, thinking person, any logical thinking person were listening and not sleeping, uh, they would have gone through all of the presentations and not recognized the need for high-speed rail. Uh, the uh, the um, fact that we're going to double in population in California to something in the neighborhood of uh, 65 million people by mid-century, uh, the fact that uh, we're fighting the importation of, uh, of petroleum as a major, the single major uh, element of our deficit balance of trade. The fact that we're fighting climate change or the rest of the world is, we are not doing a very good job in America, but we're, we're going to have to begin fighting climate change. The fact that um, every other industrialized country in the world, every other industrialized country in the world and many non-industrialized countries have found it affordable to build high-speed rail. The fact that virtually all of those high-speed rail lines have a net positive cash flow after operations costs, all of that suggests to us that uh, maybe the U.S. is not the only one right in the world. Maybe we can learn from the rest of the world on this issue. So I'm not going to talk to you about the need, I'm going to talk to you about the fiscal affordability and propriety of this project. And I'll begin by, uh, by taking you back to before any of you, even old fellows, I know it was an F word, uh, like me, uh, were around. Franklin Delano Roosevelt built us out of the Great Depression. He invested more money than we had in our treasury by far in building highways, parks, and other kinds of infrastructure, and creating hundreds and thousands and millions of jobs, and having that infrastructure available to us now, still, almost 100 years later. He showed us how to do it. Well, President Obama is doing it again right now, so history says he's doing it right. He invited some people that are here and myself back to the White House in uh, a month after he took office, sat us down in the briefing room. Uh, there were about 30 people there, 150 or so media around the back of the room, and he proceeded to talk to us from his heart about his concern for the economy and the climate of the world, the future for his, his girls. And he, he convinced me without question that the course we were taking, the course he had mapped out, was the right course. Uh, he, you know, you've got to respect that young man, even after his great success today, uh, in his announcement today. But even before that, you, had to, you have to respect him for, for trying hard doing the iconic thing, which I think we've forgotten how to do in America. Taking on a project that will last, in effect, forever. Our rail systems have lasted since the 1880s, 1860s in the United States, and we're building another one now that will last another 100 years. And that takes a bit of a different vision than someone who's just looking to make sure they get reelected in a couple of years. Now, let me talk to you about some numbers. The president, uh, as I do this, I'll click through, but I only want to show you one slide out of this, uh, this process here, if I can make it work. There we go. I'll, I'll flip through as I'm talking to you. The president determined that there would be a stimulus bill and that there would be $8 billion in that stimulus bill for high-speed rail. Now, when he went to the, uh, when he sent uh, Rahm Emanuel to the leaders of the legislature to tell them about his desire for that eight, he wanted 10 billion, uh, his, the response from Nancy and from 
the other leaders uh, were that, are you sure you want to put money into a brand new project when we don't have enough money for the other programs? And he, he was emphatic, yes, indeed, that's what he wanted to do. He got the, there's uh, the chart that identifies from the uh, California Department of Finance, the growth trends for the state. 65 billion people by mid-century, almost a doubling. Where are we gonna put them? How are we gonna move them around? How are we gonna get them to work? How are we gonna get product to the marketplace with that many people on our roads? It's a crisis in California now. Hmm, I think I skipped it. I had intended to talk a little bit longer, but there we go. Now, so he, so he demanded that we have that $8 billion in there for high-speed rail. He got it. It was distributed in very, very quick time, and now we have uh, seven different corridors building high-speed rail based on that $7 billion. Now, we have three governors who have given that money back. Florida, Wisconsin, and Ohio. Oddly enough, Wisconsin now has seen the light and is asking for their money back for their high-speed train system. Well, that's an interesting approach. Uh, they're certainly not going to get back what they gave up. But the rest of the corridors in the nation are after that money. 24 governors of which 11 are Republicans, are asking for the money given back by Florida now. That doesn't sound to me like a groundswell of repudiation to the president's iconic high-speed rail project. What it sounds to me like is that a couple of grandstanding governors uh, gave up their money. One of them has realized that he did it wrong, and the rest of us are going to benefit from their short-sightedness. California has asked for all the money because we have a project that's going to set the mode for the nation. Now let's talk about that project, and I'll ask you to look at the slide, and so as not to bore you, I won't show you too many of them. This data is from uh, uh, survey research and uh, statistical research done by Cambridge Systematics. Now, Cambridge Systematics is one of the world's finest uh, analytical firms. They're bond-worthy. They did their work not for the High-Speed Rail Authority, but they did their work under the direction of the San Francisco Bay Area Metropolitan Transportation Commission in order to have an arm's length relationship so that there could not be bias. When they came out with their research, it was criticized. I'm a statistician. I'll tell you that uh, this, this kind of, of work is very, very difficult to do reliably. There's one formula, there's one procedure that can be used and have it be acceptable to the U.S. Department of Transportation. Now, the boss of this project isn't the California High Speed Rail Authority, it's the Federal Railroad Administration. They accept only one model, and that's the model that Cambridge Systematic used. They implemented that model, and uh, there was criticism. So the High Speed Rail Authority Board had a day and a half of public hearings to find out exactly what that criticism meant. It finally came down to the fact that there were some organizations, some individuals who felt they had better models. They might, goodness, I don't know. But there's only one model that the US Department of Transportation will accept. And that's the model that Cambridge Systematic used. They were asked by a crotchety old member of our High Speed Rail Authority Board who I won't cross swords with, and that is Quentin Kopp. And the old judge looked down at him and he said, now, uh, and this was a professor from University of California, Berkeley. And he said, now, you did a careful review of this, right? And he said, yes. He started to say something and the judge says, answer yes or no. And the professor then said, yes. Uh, are, did you find any example, or was the model applied correctly? The professor said, yes. Did you, uh, Quentin then said, did you find any examples of bias injected into the application of the model? The, the, the professor said, no, and, and I would never indicate that there was bias. And uh, Quentin then admonished him to just say yes or no. I, if you've ever been with, with Judge Kopp, you'll realize that it's an experience. 
And I say that with all respect. He is an epic person in our time in history in this, in this uh, region. And, uh, and, then the, and then the professor began to say, but I have a better model. And then, uh, and then uh, the judge said, is your model certified for use by the US Department of Transportation? And the professor said, no. And he, then Quentin, like a, like a good litigator, turned to our, the attorney general's office and said, attorney general's office, could we have used the professor's model? The AG says, no, we could not until it's certified for use by the US Department of Transportation. What that tells you is that whatever these folks came up with is the best we have right now. Now, as a statistician, I'll tell you that whatever it is, it's wrong. Anytime you run this kind of a model, it's going to be wrong. It may be wrong only by a small variable, and you hope that's true, but it isn't going to be right on. It's too complex a process to project. But it's the best we have right now. And what that model said, it tested three different levels of ridership cost between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. A full cost of a plane ticket, which was calculated at $110 per direction, three quarters of a cost at about 85, and a half cost at 55. Well, I'm showing you the $55 per direction because that's the least profitable. That shows the largest number of riders but it shows you the lowest profit because as you increase the cost, fewer people ride, you have fewer trains to pay for, have fewer ma little lower maintenance on the tracks, and your profit margin goes up as a proportion of your gross. But the Public Utility Commission will probably have to decide that. So assuming the Public Utility Commission says, we have a project here that's for the people of the state of California, so we want the lowest price to give them the best service. I'm not saying they're gonna do that, but assume they did. We still have $1.1 billion net profit after all operating and maintenance costs. That's the money that we would expect to see invested back into helping us build the project with the public-private partnership and paying an annual franchise fee that would be used forever to maintain this project and expand this project into other parts of the state and possibly on over to Phoenix. To give it to you by numbers, the project has to be done by 2020 according to Prop 1A. That's the starter project from Anaheim up to San Francisco. It should carry at $55 per direction, something in the neighborhood of 45 to 55 million riders per year, which is a pretty modest load, I should tell you, in terms of international characteristics. $2.4 billion gross, $1.1 billion net after all O&M. Now the funding for the project is supposed to come from about 17 to 19 billion dollars in federal funding. I don't think we're going to get that much. Certainly not as quickly as we wanted to because of the change in leadership in Congress. Nine billion dollars in state funds are in the bank. The private partnership I think is going to go up significantly. And that's currently calculated at 10 to 12 billion dollars, but I think the private partners are going to see the opportunity of making an even higher return, and we hope, we hope, Dennis, uh, that uh, the uh, private uh, investments will be higher. Local share, in, and uh, Maria's already working on that with her beautiful station, will be primarily coming from the uh, local cities building their stations. And of course, if the local community wants to build the Taj Mahal, uh, or something that makes the Taj Mahal look anemic, like uh, the Transmit Terminal will, then that's great. If they want a big bus stop, then the High Speed Rail Authority will build them a big bus stop. But there's all logic for the cities to invest heavily in that project, in those stations, because it's going to create a tremendous amount of revenue based on property tax value increases around those stations. And that goes into the bank of a city. So I'm going to look forward to answering your questions. But right now, we know from a survey done by the American Public Transit Association in January, it's done by the Harris uh, Poll Company, very uh, objective, very fine organization, 2,500 unit national sample, indicated that 62% of the people in the nation 
wanted the federal government to build them a high-speed rail line. In California, it was higher. 73% wanted to see government build a high-speed rail project. So the public's way ahead of us, policymakers. It's, it's about time for us to catch up. Remember, there's no risk because it has to be a public-private partnership. It says right in Proposition 1A that it will be a public-private partnership. If the private partners don't see a profit, they're not going to invest their money. And if they don't invest their money, there will be no bids and there will be no project. So the public is protected. This project is not different than those 30 other corridors that have been built around the world. And those projects are making a profit now on operations. I just talked to Dennis. He affirmed that each one of the French lines has a net positive cash flow after their operating costs. The Japanese system is broken up into four different private companies, traded on the stock market, making a profit, giving a dividend to their stockholders. The Italian company has just been given over to a private corporation. The chair of the board, of course, is the president of Ferrari, so he's repainted the trains all red. And, but it's making a profit in its first year of operation. Are we the only ones right in America by delaying so long in having a high-speed rail system? I think not. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rod. Now we'll hear from Denise Dutte. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very uh, pleased uh, to be speaking now, and I will not refer to the California weather or to the great and nice audience, but to be speaking just before Donna, because she is such a terrific speaker and debater that you don't want to speak after her or debate with her. <laughs> to introduce um, the operator's role and importance, I will start with uh, some basics uh, and examples. What you see here on the left, it refers also to what uh, Lisa Schweitzer uh, talked about this morning is, uh, are these projects worth public subsidies? So on the left, what you see, of course, is that um, the total net value, if it is represented on the left, you have to fund it a private part, which has to be covered by revenues which have to be over that. And then, of course, the public funding is justified, provided that the sum of the, those two is smaller than this, of course. So, but uh, the other question is, uh, where do the subsidies come from, which is uh, another question. So on the right, what you see is the latest implemented high-speed line in France, the TGV uh, east towards Strasbourg. Um, on the left, you have the, all the investment costs, um, infrastructure, including stations, and rolling stock. So what was the part of the private funding compared to the public funding there? And by, in private funding, as you see, which was basically only SNCF, uh, funded all the rolling stock, plus 15% of the total infrastructure, mainly the stations, but not only. So the key question, of course, is to have a profitable operation, making the highest profit, and being able to pay as much as possible a big chunk of the infrastructure. Second um, slide is about the um, Paris to Marseille line, and we heard this morning from Yves Crouzet that it compares very well to uh, San Diego to LA, same distance. Um, and the summary is here, and he presented, and, and Julien also, the, the, it was three different lines from Paris-Lyon first, 1981 for the first part, the southern part of Paris-Lyon, 1994, 2001. Um, and there are, so the cost in, um, euros of 2003 per kilometer, so there was a significant increase, which also reflect the severe increase in environmental mitigation costs. Public subsidy from zero to 11%, and the uh, financial rate of return and economical rate of return, which has to be in all cases above 8%, as you can see on the first line, it was, it was um, a great number. What is of interest here for California is first, to see that between the first line implemented, and this was between saint florent rotin and Saturn and north of Lyon in 1981, and the latest, which has been opened in 2001, it's 20 years. 
So if, if you add to that, the construction time for the first section is 25 years. So this, of course, is relatively encouraging for California. Uh, and the other thing, which is not shown here, but at the same time as this part, um, there was a, a, a small section which was added to go into Paris, meaning that, as we speak today, there's no high-speed line going to the center of Paris or center of Marseille, but it's getting as close as make economic sense. And after 10 years, I mean, even 13 years, so from 1981 until 1994, there was no approaching closer to Paris. But after 13 years, additional miles were built towards Paris. And this, I think, is a good example for what could happen in California. Now, um, how is the TGV business looking like in terms of revenue split? So this is uh, 2010 numbers in terms of percentages. Uh, the overall business of TGV in France is a little over $9 billion. Um, so as you can see, you have operation energy. This is maintenance of rolling stock. On the other side, you have rolling stock amortization. Here you have infrastructure, both um, of course maintenance and also amortization, ticketing and stations, and then structure, taxes, and profit. I think what is of course very important is to show a profit, first of all, to be able to pay taxes, but also that the system is able to pay not only for its entire O&M, but also for the renewal of the rolling stock and also the um, infrastructure. So this is all included, which is of course very encouraging, especially since we have seen that um, beyond the first line which was extremely profitable, we are building lines which are less and less profitable. They are still profitable, but less and less. So, um, high-speed rail can be a success story, as we have seen, and um, there should be no over-promise, as Yves Crozé said this morning, but to achieve it, uh, especially here, we think that it is very important to have an early operator involvement. Early operator involvement so helps in the planning and design phase, as well as the construction phase, even of course before the operating phase. The idea is to eliminate avoidable costs, which can be very costly during o and M. I I mean, after operation starts, uh, because when you design it, you can easily overlook a number of issues, such as life cycle costs, standardizations, or ease of maintenance. So the idea is to involve the um, operator as early as possible and in all phases. This is, of course, critical for the long-term uh, project success. So going in more details, in the design and build phase, the environment right from the design phase um, ensure that the line alignment, the configuration, will include all the characteristics that make the success of the operation such as passenger service operation, operating costs, and so the economic results. So all these parameters relate to infrastructure, rolling stock, safety standards, and I will go deeper in infrastructure and safety standards. Regarding O&M, um, the inclusion of the uh, operator early on enables to optimize the trip time, and this starts with setting up the right speed limit uh, but also the speed limit for each turnout, because how quickly should you enter the stations, or how quickly should you divert to uh, uh, Sacramento when you are coming from uh, the Central Valley uh, compared to uh, San Francisco, for instance. The, um, and such details as um, boarding and alighting times in stations and uh, door closing for the uh, trains, these are small details, but which are, of course, very important where you are considering a multi-decade operation of a system. Train set maintenance costs, it's very important that what is important is not only how much you buy the train sets, but how much they will cost you to, uh, to maintain and how efficient they will be in day-to-day -day operation and of course uh, give a great service to the customers. So cost of train sets of course can be also uh, optimized with the input of the operator. So the operator is also to prepare for the pre our opening phase, and of course only the operator know exactly what it costs and what is required there. 
In fact, in short, the operator represents the long-term interests of the passengers and also the public at large. Regarding the infrastructure, I will go fairly quickly on that, but um, uh, the uh, right infrastructure requires the right design, of course, to achieve the level of quality and performance required. Uh, the uh, infrastructure has to be available every day for comfortable and safe travel. Um, it has to be maintained at reasonable cost and to be built, of course, safely to um, the speeds of, um, of operation. And of course, again, the operator is in the best position to make sure that these criteria are met during both design and construction. Safety, of course, for such a system is always a given, like for an airline. It's uh, supposed to be safe, uh, of course. But this is an area where it is very easy to do some over-engineering, and you don't want to do that in terms of cost, but provided you guarantee total safety. Um, and also, safety it's, is an easy area where you can delay totally a project regarding signaling, regarding certification of rolling stock. I mean, if we look at the uh, worldwide experience, this is where most of the big delays have occurred. Now, let's look at not the cost side, but the revenue side. Here again, the operator can bring a lot because he can... Uh, think about the maximization of the revenues in the, uh, of course, intercity trips, the uh, um, capture of the commuter rail market with the right intermodal connections, the right connections with the airport. Um, what is of paramount importance is the yield management system, pricing system, like the airlines, to make sure that you first, of course, fill your planes, uh, have a high uh, load factor, but at the same time that you manage correctly all those passengers and then you take the most advantage of these passengers in terms of revenues, maximize using well the assets. And there are also other revenues to be considered which are equally important um, and these can be maximized by early agreements with different entities such as uh, Disney convention centers and others. And I did not mention what we could add also making sure that the uh, ancillary revenues such as parking lots which are a, use, a big money maker for airports, but not only airports, uh, can go um, on the project side. This uh, you have seen already in Michel Leboeuf's presentation, which was showing that, um, and this is only the cost side, but increasing the speed significantly from 186 miles per hour to 224 is something that overall costs a little more in terms of O&M, but can bring a lot more revenue. So it's a trade-off, of course, between revenue and um, additional expenses, but uh, as uh, Michel Leboeuf uh, detailed yesterday, it's in fact very affordable in, in the favor of the project. Some fairly detailed issues now, which one don't necessarily easily think about, is the maintenance of way. Uh, of course, to maintain such a system, you need to have maintenance of way facilities, yet yeah, they need to be appropriately located and designed. So this means that uh, um, you need to have the right mileage to cover with them. You have to be able to answer quickly to crisis or problems so that uh, we consider, for instance, uh, in France that the system has to be reactive within 45 minutes. That means that if there is a problem which is mentioned at one point, 45 minutes later, people have to be on the site, anywhere on the field, on the line. So, of course, this has some pretty big impact on where you locate the maintenance uh, uh, of way facility. You need to, of course, um, plan the appropriate number of people and the uh, right qualifications. And you have, of course, to, dis to take into account the uh, environmental aspects because these places make noise at night, rather. So you cannot put them in the middle of cities. Um, and you need to take the appropriate mitigation measures. Just as an illustration, uh, you can see here the example of the full developed system, and again, you need to take into account the future for the first phase already. So you can see that, for instance, Stockton makes perfect sense for the location of an intensive way facility because it's very well centralized compared to Sacramento, all the way to Modesto and to the Bay Area. 
I will not expand too much on that because we've seen a lot of that in the past two days, but uh, the operator can help a lot in the station location decision because it's key for accessibility, intermodality and connectivity issues and the uh, development opportunities and we have talked a lot about that in the past two days. Um, so the operator has to help there to make sure, he is not of course designing the station, he is there to make sure that they are operable and they will help bringing the highest revenue and they are designed correctly also in terms of track layout, for instance. So a couple of examples from uh, high-speed rail stations, how they integrate in the uh, urban uh, landscape and so on. Another thing which has been debated already uh, pretty much here was the importance of connectivity. Um, and this is to be worked on early on because so as to make sure that you have a great coordination and maybe only one ticket for more than one system, you need to plan that far in advance. And this coordination is, of course, for ticketing, also for information, um, because if you have a problem on one of the system, it can be a bus feeding the train or the train feeding um, a light rail, you need to be able to connect the information between the uh, systems. Of course, uh, I should have mentioned that first, probably is the scheduling um, coordination, so as um, things are uh, especially in uh, connection one with the other, and this is even more important when the system is not complete, if you go on on a different system to go to the end, which may be, of course, again, of application in California. You need, of course, to have coordination for um, perturbations and crises, and all this brings mutual benefits to the different systems. What coordination with the airlines? We have talked about that also, uh, especially uh, this morning with Ida, um, when she mentioned the Heathrow issue. The uh, illustration here is we also saw that SFO Airport is the most congested in California. And you can make sure that both for the airlines and for the airports, it makes more sense to have two planes like that for one 20-seat turboprop from Fresno uh, because today, because of the safety requirement of distance, it's what you are comparing things in terms of one slot for one turboprop is two slots for two Airbus A380. So um, the experience in France uh, and elsewhere also has been that at the beginning, airlines would be fighting because they think they can compete on the same routes, but the uh, result is that they don't, and it's way better to plan that in advance, to coordinate so that the uh, airlines can take advantage of that and integrate their service with the uh, rail service. And this, of course, again, uh, the operator can help a great deal in that. So what can the operator do for the um, high-speed rail authority here in California? Uh, it can help, of course, face all the challenges which are currently met by the authority in developing and implementing a high-speed rail system. Question is to be on time and on budget as much as possible. It may be difficult. Meet the standards of quality and performance. We've talked about that. Be safe, reliable, maintainable, economically sustainable. And here in California, of course, the challenges are amplified by the federal scrutiny on it. It's the only high-speed rail plan which is still alive currently in the United States. And so, in fact, as uh, someone else said in Texas, failure is not an option. Now, why choose the operator as early as possible? We talked about that at length already, but the operator can invest early. And what you want is to have actors who are putting skin in the game, which, of course, is not the case as long as you don't have these types of actors really planning and studying things. And the operator, of course, in the, is in the best position to take some of the ridership risk and also to um, build a firewall to the taxpayers that Lisa uh, Schweitzer was talking about um, this morning. So no one has interests more aligned with those of the authority than the operator, has the greatest stake in the system, has a better view of how to design, and is in a better position to address technical and commercial risks. And they are all listed here. 
So our experience suggests that uh, early operator involvement is key, and it can be in two ways. I mean, it can be either directly contracting with the authority, or it can be through a public-private partnership, and there can be different options for that. Um, but the process of involving the operator early on is also something which is better for the project overall, because not only does it achieve all what I mentioned, which is ensure the best profitability of the system, but it also um, preserves and enhances competition, for instance, for the equipment or for the infrastructure constru construction, because you are comparing this model with a model where you, um, you bid for a consortia bringing everything at the same time, which is rail equipment together with the infrastructure together with the system. It also facilitates the information exchange between the different companies and the authority, and it enables the authority to select the best possible consortium for the equipment and the system and the construction of infrastructure. And so this is why we think there is um, a clear way forward for success in California, but it's uh, still a tricky one and uncertain path. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Denise. And we'll hear from Don Andrews now. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's quite interesting when you get invited to something and you find that you're the last speaker and you think, I'll say, what do you do? How do you engage people? How do you continue to get them involved in what you're talking about? The first thing I want to do is I want to thank um, for this opportunity to address you today. This is kind of nostalgic for me. I see a lot of people that I've seen over the years. Um, I want to tell you a quick story before I get down to business <laughs> and making businesses out of high-speed rail. I was in my second year of law school, and I was headed to the Capitol uh, mm -hmm. to discuss an environmental justice issue that I was very passionate about. And someone said to me, and that was the Richard Cass, as a matter of fact, he says, you know, I got something for you. I'm going to take you to the speaker's office. So he took me to the speaker's office, and that was Willie Brown at the time. And in 1993, I was still in law school. I got appointed to the California High Speed Rail Authority. And it wasn't the authority at the time. It was a feasibility commission to sort of see what's feasible about the high speed rail. So I had to talk to Rod, because I said, you know, at one point, I used to kind of stand up and espouse and say to people, I was the youngest serving member, and I served the longest on the high-speed rail than anybody else. But I think Rod served 10 years, and I served 10 years off and on as well. So I really want to speak to the, critis, crit, crit, uh, the critics excuse me, and also talk about the business side to this. When I got interested in the high-speed rail, I didn't get interested in the high-speed rail because I was thinking about all the politics that were going to get involved. I get interested because I travel throughout the world. And there was something about me that had this amazing sense of entitlement. And I thought, why can't California have a California high-speed rail? Why can't we have that? That's just amazing to me. And I knew back then that it was very important for us to start thinking about what was going to happen in the future population how we're going to really have an integrated system in terms of transit and what that really meant. And that was very important to me. So when I started thinking about what I was going to talk to everyone today, I started trying to frame it in the context of Atlas Shrug. I said, you know what, this is Dagny's train. I'm going to get John Gott built. So if anybody's read Atlas Shrug, you know what I'm talking about. And what was very interesting about that, who, if you haven't seen the movie yet and you haven't read the book, and it doesn't go into all of her commentary, but it was really an amazing situation where you had the politicians, you had the business people, you had the visionaries trying to come together with something that was very important. So I thought that was going to be my framework. And then just recently, this past weekend, I saw the, literally the, the documentary that was done by the late Pat Brown's granddaughter. And it was amazing to me about the vision that, and, and Rod talked about going back in terms of Roosevelt, but we have had this vision in California for a long, long time. So my point is, the train is coming. The high-speed rail is coming. And for those of us who see opportunities, because we talk about jobs all the time, 
And I say to people, when you talk about jobs, you're also talking about businesses. And when you talked about the chamber, you were absolutely right about that. So what is the high-speed rail all about in terms of making a business inside of it? And I want to just get a show of hands of all the individuals who are here today who are looking for business opportunities with the high-speed rail. This is good stuff here. This is really good stuff because at the end of the day, you hear a lot of information and you start thinking to yourself because at the end of the day, business leaders and entrepreneurs, we have a sense of how we're gonna get involved. Now I could be a little cruder and I could say, well, how are we gonna make money off of this? But that's not really the case. What exactly are our opportunities for the high-speed rail? So Rod, you told me to go click one. When you look at what we know now, we know that California High Speed Rail Project was spark economic growth. We know there's significant economic development. Maria, you gave an amazing case of that. We talked about maintaining and developing regional business culture. We have talked about this, and everybody talks about this. So what do we know? What we know now is that jobs, jobs, jobs. Everybody talks about jobs. Billions of dollars in infrastructure, construction, and financing, 600 construction-related jobs over the course of building the project, 450,000 procurement new jobs, 2.2 unemployment. We talk about all the problems and how we can address those problems. And then we say, how do we get there? How do we actually make sense out of this high-speed rail? How do we look at this as a business opportunity? Well, when I was on the high-speed rail authority, and I've since done that, and I'm on the private side, so everybody's kind of switched, <laughs> kind of on the private side, the public side, like you have done. And I remember Don from 1995 as well. But I started thinking, you know, this is great for the state. The business opportunities are there. And then I start thinking about us as a small business, how do you really get involved? How do you really engage yourself? And so I'm gonna do something that's a little kind of contrarian. And it probably be as uh, different than what we've talked about before, and that is, we have local opportunities with current transportation projects that we can connect to. We have an existing infrastructure throughout the state of local communities who have seen this vision and who, are, who understand how to connect to it. So when you think about business opportunities, we have to think about, do you connect with those opportunities at the state level, or do you connect with those opportunities at the local level? And where is the value added in doing so? So when I talk about small and disadvantaged businesses, and I talk about business opportunity generally, how do you connect and make it happen? And Rod will tell you that there was something that the High Speed Rail did that was quite extraordinary. They had a, you know, you, you give your interests and you report out what you see as your opportunities and you go to these big opportunities throughout the state and you network with companies and you try to make it happen. But the question becomes how do you connect? How does that translate into actually seeing yourself on a job? Now we know that there's a lot of big companies who are very open to small businesses and, and involving them in terms of opportunities. But if I were to tell you from my point of view, I would go to Don. That's where I would go. I would say, what are you doing with high-speed rail and how can I connect to what you're doing? That would be my choice as opposed to going to the state. I'm not saying that's a good thing. As, as a matter of fact, I think we should do it that way so we can basically be more accessible to individuals who want to have business opportunities. Public-private partnerships, we talk about that all the time. We look at future procurement opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities here from civil infrastructure, facilities, stations, and a number of people have spoken about this in the past. And you look at the goals that the um, high-speed rail has set. And of course, my, my staff put a little plug in there for, uh, they figure I was doing this for the day. I should have a little plug in there in terms of the Lee Andrews group. But the point is, is that how do we connect to the business opportunities with the high-speed rail? And what are the portals to do so? And I think it's the local projects. I really believe that. And there may be some discussion points around that. Plans and programs to encourage and guide development across the station. Again, when you look at developers and you look at other people, redevelopment agencies and the like, other people who are doing exactly what Maria is doing and others who are doing and connect to those opportunities. These are how you really get involved in the resources that are being provided. Uh, you have the leverage to major infrastructure development. We talked about that. I don't want to go into details about that. I'm kind of wrapping it up very quickly so we can have Q&A. 
So we're hoping to attract a lot in investment, and Dennis talked about the operator, and I think that's a very important concept, quite frankly. And we have looked at this project in terms of design, build, and other paradigms that are really important, and we all are very accustomed to that. And you also have an opportunity to participate in that regard. Um, and what do they have here? Coordinate seven form of expression. Let me go back a little, a little bit. So when you think about the business opportunities and how you connect, you think about how, for example, businesses like ours have been involved in this for a long time. Dan has been around forever. A lot of people have been around. I'm not gonna say that critically, but it's a good thing. A lot of people, a lot of companies have been tracking this. I remember the first time I had an opportunity for procurement and I really looked out into the audience and it was the first time I had seen so many people throughout the state saying that they were really interested in participating. But what they, when they got excited about it, they got excited about it because they really believed that at the end of the day they were gonna have an opportunity. So I'm gonna close and then I'll take Q&A. But what I'm gonna close with is that everyone in this room and all the people who've been speaking all day, we have to challenge and go back to what Michael O'Hare said, because I agree with him to a certain extent, and that is I don't believe that our political leaders can't get this done. I think they can get it done. But I do believe that when you start looking at legitimacy and what makes this real for those individuals who voted for it, Yes, this is a good example in Northern California. Rod would argue that I want to see a similar example in Southern California. But people have to see how this is realized. And the way they see it is through jobs. We can talk about jobs all day and night, but they have to also see businesses who have a, a, a opportunity to create these jobs. And you know, I, th I think we should start thinking about that and challenging that. When you look at your legislators and you talk about high-speed rail and you talk about our challenges, the first thing they say is that I have not seen a group of business leaders come my way and really discuss to me how best we move forward on this project. So I'm gonna conclude with a challenge to everyone that we look at how we can come together um, and, and you know, at one point, and Rod, you can speak to this as well, we had a business advisory group. Do you remember that, Rod? We had a business advisory group, and it consisted of businesses throughout the state of California. We had the chambers involved, and we had a number of agencies involved, and we had key business leaders who were able to help map out, not the business plan for the high-speed rail, but actually able to map out what they believe would be their staffing plans if they were to get a procurement with the high-speed rail. That was some powerful information to share with individuals so they could understand. So with that, I'm gonna close, and I thank you all. Thanks very much, Donna, and thanks everybody for being on schedule. It, it may be because this is a panel of engineers and business people, but everybody was right on time. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here, but I'd encourage you to get some more. So while you're scribbling, just a couple of thoughts. When Jim put up on the screen uh, the cover of this report the Economic Institute did in 2008 on the impact or benefit of high-speed rail, specifically for the Bay Area, uh, that brought to mind a couple of uh, a couple of things that came out of that analysis for us. One that he mentioned was the question of airports and airport congestion. Uh, it's a particular issue here in the Bay Area. You might remember 10 years ago, eight, uh, SFO had a plan to expand its runways. Uh, it became quite a, uh, a stress conversation because the only place you could expand runways at SFO is in the Bay, and there's a lot of issues about filling the Bay. Uh, in the end, they had to abandon the plan because politically it appeared infeasible to get it through. I think Jim remembers a lot of that fight. Uh, and I think most people sense is there isn't much stomach or much political likelihood in the foreseeable future of SFO actually ever expanding those runways, at least not anytime soon. Uh, nevertheless, the forecasts, although they were set back by a couple of recessions, are that eventually, not too far down the road, it's going to meet capacity in the way to do with those flights. And our, our feeling was that if you brought in high-speed rail, and I think this SFO was, was of the same point of view, that would enable the airport to start to shift its load factors and its traffic away from a higher volume of smaller aircraft that take up about the same amount of space on a runway in terms of spacing uh, to more profitable, long-range routes, basically international transcontinental. 
uh, reducing congestion on the LA San Francisco Air Corridor, which is the most heavily trafficked short haul corridor in the country. So there is a regional intergovernmental body here in the Bay Area called RAPC, the Regional Airport Planning Committee, that tries to do on behalf of the agencies here is long-term planning for airport traffic. And it's going to come out with its new plan very soon. And what it'll show is there are various scenarios for how you could reduce long-range uh, congestion at all of our airports and how you could increase uh, capacity in order to move people around uh, by air and otherwise. And there are technology um, solutions to get more airplanes in. There's some infrastructure ones. You can move some flights to regional small airports. But the best scenario, uh, from the airport and the airline standpoint, this is really an air capacity issue, is all those options work best with high-speed rail. Because if you have high-speed rail there, it will allow the major airports, and this is really SFO primarily, but also San Jose, to move some of that air traffic onto the rail they go to more profitable routes. Without high-speed rail, it becomes much more difficult to meet our long-term uh, air capacity uh, uh, requirements. So an important issue for airports. Uh, we looked at the issue from a business standpoint and a workforce standpoint. And one of the findings we had was that having high-speed rail, this was especially true for Silicon Valley, where a lot of the workforce commutes in a long way. People take the ACE train from Stockton, they're coming in from Modesto, and they're coming in from Tracy, and uh, a long way away, a terrible congestion, is that with high-speed rail, you increase the catchment area for employers. So it's a lot easier for an employer, say in Silicon Valley, to draw in workforce from the Central Valley, where it's more affordable for a lot of people to live than in the Valley. Uh, and people would arrive, one would expect, fresher than if they had an hour and a half drive coming in and out. So there is an economic benefit we are finding for employers in expanding the catchment area for their, their workforce, and I would expect LA would have a similar uh, benefit. Uh, we also found a productivity benefit. You know, so congestion uh, has a cost. Uh, about 150,000 hours a day are lost by barrier commuters sitting in roads. Uh, that's about a $2.5 billion annual cost. You could say reducing congestion uh, in increases productivity. I think we've heard already about the real estate and tax benefits of redevelopment of business districts around uh, the Transbay Terminal, Deridon Station. So uh, lots, lots of benefits uh, on, on, on the upside, uh, aside from quality of life. But at the, at the end of the day, we need business models. It needs to pencil out. And I wanted to ask a question uh, to Denise but uh, it could also be for you, Rod, or anybody else. Uh, and this is on public-private partnerships. So the state of California in the last couple of years has moved uh, somewhat aggressively to open the door to more public-private partnerships, uh, to get more business activity, both in investing and operating certain kinds of infrastructure, including transportation. And uh, there's a public infrastructure advisory commission uh, that is helping to design that. The first big transportation project is the Presidio Parkway from the Golden Gate Bridge to downtown San Francisco. Other projects are being talked about around the state. But we saw on your slides a lot of criteria and why it's good to get an operator in early. But from the standpoint of an operator, when you look at California and you see all these factors, how does California look as an environment for an operator or another private sector partner to come in? Does it look promising at this moment? What would California have to do uh, to get uh, that kind of direct engagement, skin in the game, by the private sector partners? Because I would think that once you get some serious partners in at the table, the entire the numbers start to move around and get better, and it becomes more credible to a lot of people who are still skeptical. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, in fact, we have looked at that very early on, and uh, over a year ago, we developed uh, uh, the, an answer to, to, to your question, because it's, uh, it's tricky. And why is it tricky? Uh, very obviously, because a project of that magnitude, we are talking about over $40 billion, at least, um, it cannot be defined early on, and as long as it is not defined enough, the private sector, of course, will not step in which make it, makes it very difficult to start even the PPP process. 
So um, what we came up with is something which is already in existence here in the US and even uh, considered in California, which is called the pre-development agreement type of PPP. And what is that? Um, to translate it in, in the high speed rail uh, situation would be for the authority to issue an RFP to select a private partner uh, with whom um, this private partner could be ultimately the operator. But for the short term, let's say a one year period, this partner, after of course a competitive process, would be developing together with the authority a refined plan of uh, detailed ridership study, uh, I mean investment grade, we don't have that today, um, very detailed costs which are related to credible options of route, of stations, and so on and so forth. So the right costs, so this enables to do the business plan and then the financing plan. And in fact, the, our experience also, uh, particularly in Europe, and uh, Rod was uh, mentioning the NTV uh, Italian uh, project, we are involved in that. And for the financial community, as long as they don't have credible uh, actors involved, they will not step in. So today, they are not ready to step in the California project. So after one year, and this requires close work between the authority and the, and the uh, private partner, then at the end, you have a credible plan with a reasonable prospect of financing it. And at that point, either both um, sides are happy, the numbers are right, and it's credible for both sides, and it goes on with the same people. Of course, with an expanded team, probably, because what you have in the first phase is different uh, than what you need in the construction phase. You need to include program management, probably. And this, again, relates to what I mentioned, which is with this concept, you are able then to go for bids for construction <coughs> sectors, for equipment, supply, and for the system. Uh, and again, after the construction, I mean, yeah, and if, if one of the two sides is not happy, private sector thinks that uh, there are too many risks. Or the private or the authority thinks the uh, private partner has done a lousy job. There, there has to be exit clauses for both sides, which are satisfactory. So, but, but the base case is it goes on. So it is constructed, and again, because the operator has skin in the game, because in that period, the idea is also that the private partner puts skin in the game. How is that? But not by not making profit in this um, situation, ju just doing it own cost. Uh, I mean, without profit, which is a kind of skin in the game. So after construction phase, then again, provided everyone is happy, then you start operation with either the same actor or different one, but basically, let's say, the same one. And then you start, and you, this is when you have the major risks in terms of how will the ridership build up, for instance, what are the technical uh, problems that can be met at the beginning with the equipment, with the signaling, with whatever. But after two or three years, then it's time to monetize the system because all the risks are managed. Everyone knows how much revenue is coming in and prospected to come in. And you can refinance the whole thing. So, I mean, this is a little complicated and detailed, but this is a way to, um, to include the private sector. And, and we thought it was the best, one, best way to do it. I, I I think what's just been uh, described is a, is a very creditable approach. It's a little less competitive than I'd hope to be, um, but it's a very creditable approach. Let me, let me describe a slightly different approach that could be used, though it's, it's more risky. And that would be to and it seems to be what Florida was about to do before they, uh, they imploded and gave their money back. And it's what I thought we were leading towards by encouraging consortia to be built, put together for a bidding process here in California. And that would be for a consortia to be gathered around. Of course, a consortia would have all the skills necessary to, uh, to design, build, operate, and maintain the system, uh, probably focused around a prime contractor, the prime contractor, the unique prime contractors would probably be based on, on real car manufacturers that, that tend to be the unique element of, of the project. And those consortia then, 
after the environmental work is done, the, the corridors are certified, the, uh, the character of the construction is certified uh, so that you know whether you're going to be on grade under, uh, underground or elevated uh, at any element of the project. Uh, then the consortia would bid against each other with the bid point being how much the consortia would be willing to invest in the project in order to create the private portion of the public-private partnership. And the two bid nexuses would be how much the consortia would guarantee to put into the project to complete the construction, and secondly, how much they would guarantee to pay on an annual basis for, in effect, a franchise fee. Now, that's an oversimplification of an extremely complicated process, but that's a different approach that um, I, I thought the high-speed rail authority in California was pursuing. And the advantage of that approach is that you settle up front the amount of private investment you're going to have involved, which then lets you project more effectively uh, how much you can build. If you pre, as, as Dennis uh, suggested, if you pre-select, uh, the, the organization that would eventually be uh, in the other model would be your prime contractor, then there is not as strong a potential for, for competition to maximize the amount of private investment that can be uh, injected into the project. At least that's my perception, and it may not be as accurate uh, as it would need to be but that's, that's, a, that's my sense. Both approaches are creditable. I think the latter approach creates a little more competition and might squeeze a little more private investment into the process. Thanks. We have a number of questions now. Um, they don't group together very well, but two are sort of similar. Uh, one is, have studies been done on how much passengers would be willing to pay for high-speed rail tickets? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a user question. And also, how much outreach has the authority done to developers for transit-oriented developments? Could, could I comment on the, uh, on the ridership and Please. then the TOD? I have some thoughts about TOD, but I, there are people here that are much better on TOD than I am. I mentioned the Cambridge Systematic Study, which was a vast study. It cost $2.5 million. Uh, and uh, there was quite a bit of survey research work uh, in regard to potential ridership attitudes. And uh, they came forward with projections at various prices, uh, which have been criticized, uh, may, or not, may or may not be accurate. They certainly are suggesting a rather substantial amount of ridership possibility. But let me offer a thought, and, and this is something that <laughs> our CEO of, of the High Speed Rail Authority shared and was criticized for, but I really kind of agree with him. And it's almost a going back to the old, you build it and they will come attitude. We know what high speed rail has done around the world. We know what the corridors look like, where they were successful. We know the general populations in those corridors. We know the distances between trip generators, major employment locations, major uh, metropolitan centers. And when you compare all of those from around the world with what we have in California, we are about as ideal a situation as you can find. The distances between our major trip generators are perfect. The fact that we're rapidly growing is a huge advantage. The fact that we don't have more room to pave roads coming in and out of our metropolitan centers is another huge advantage. The fact that the corridor between San Francisco and San Jose, and I think Jim mentioned it a minute ago, maybe you did, Sean, uh, is the most uh, crowded uh, air corridor in the world. You know why it's the most crowded air corridor in the world? It's because all of those other areas that have high-speed rail don't use short hop airlines between their major cities anymore. They let the high-speed train take care of those short, what used to be short hop airline uh, service. So when you look at all of those logic points, you have to conclude that we're a perfect high-speed rail market. Now, we've got to prove it by bringing in the consultants, and we'll pay them more in the future in order to give us more data. But my gut says that our system is going to be successful. I'd like to comment. I think the 
studies have all shown that basically the high-speed rail fare, for instance, San Francisco to Los Angeles one way, tracks very well with whatever current airline fare you're looking at. And of course, now with higher fuel costs, you're looking at higher uh, fares. But you were looking four years ago when the studies were done at $55 uh, fares and at the low end and $55 train fares. Uh, now you're looking at a low end fare to LA of at least $100 one way on an airline. So clearly the, the competition uh, for the train dollar, the value for the train dollar will be there. How about the transit oriented development question? Anybody want to take that up? Can you repeat the question? Can you oh, repeat the uh, question? Uh, what kind of outreach has been done to developers for transit-oriented development? Uh, well, with respect to the Transbay Joint Powers Authority, we work very closely with the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, and they, in fact, are the ones that uh, do the outreach to the development community with respect to the parcels that we will be developing. We have one parcel, and you saw it in the video, the transit tower, the 1,000-foot proposed tower, all-office tower, that we will be, uh, or that we have, uh, in fact, uh, a developer for, uh, Heinz Development Corporation uh, currently that we're in negotiations with. Uh, so the way we did that outreach is we put out an international competition a number of years ago to select both an architect and a developer-led team that would, um, where the architect would design both the tower and the station and the developer would develop the tower. Um, just by way of background, uh, the state of California transferred 12 developable acres to the Trans Bay Joint Powers Authority in San Francisco with the express conditions that we use the proceeds from the sale of those parcels as well as the tax increment to develop the new transit station and build the rail extension. So um, we've been in, uh, doing extensive community outreach uh, as well as educating the development community, the business community on upcoming uh, requests for proposals that we'll be putting out. We put out timelines and schedules for that. Um, and that, of course, has been hampered somewhat by the um, economic recession that we faced um, in the last few years. Uh, but the outreach goes through our, both our offices as well as the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, and we've got an extensive database of developers who are looking forward to RFPs when they are ready to be issued by the Redevelopment Agency. Uh, TOD is an interesting, very interesting uh, uh, issue and when you talk to very no two people like I believe will tell you what TOD really means to them uh, they'll not have the same type of, uh, of answer uh, TOD is a uh, as it has been happening it seems that you're looking at a smaller footprint than what we need to look at and uh, one of the, uh, the if you look at the ridership studies that the uh, that the high speed rail system has currently right now and we look at uh, in our little neck of the woods down in Los Angeles we show boardings at some point or of 4800 in a in a in one particular point where we need to park 4800 vehicles in and around Los Angeles Union Station which if anybody's been down to Los Angeles Union Station understand that there I don't think there's that much available space around LA Union Station and the problem is is that when you look at that type of a footprint for that type of a structure you ask yourself how much of that could be actually deterred onto other modes of transportation the fact of the matter is if you put a large parking structure next to a train station it does become if you build it they will come what you need to do is find a way to put that in that system, but also develop a means to encourage people to take transit to get to that. So public, so public transit becomes a very important aspect of it. So when you start thinking about this in the order of transit-oriented development, you start becoming, a, a start increasing your radius a little bit, and you start opening it up to other ideas, other businesses, other modes of transportation, and also trying to figure out ways to have circulars to run there to feed your station. Uh, in Los Angeles, we are about to start on this master planning effort that I've talked to you about. And part of that is going to be how we can move that about and also working with the local team in trying to develop parking structures that can serve high-speed rail but at the same time do not become these monstrous behemoth structures right next to our, our classic train station that we really don't need in, uh, in our areas. So 
when we start thinking about TOD, we really need to start looking at means of saying to, these, to, the, to the local communities, this is what we need for a footprint. Where do you want it? And what can we do to help you in reaching your needs as far as transit-oriented development and how we can get people there and how we can work together to make it work? Yeah. Uh, Sean, may I please uh, stress one point, and that is that um, TOD will work if your stations are in your downtown cores. If you try to do what Taiwan did, and they're the only high-speed train system, by the way, that went bankrupt and had to be reorganized, and you put your stations out on the farmlands because it's cheaper to do, then you're not gonna have riders because there's nobody around the thing to ride. Uh, well, the California High-Speed Rail Authority project, because of the encouragement of the League of Conservation Voters and Sierra Club, has cited all of their stations in downtown cores. Now we might have 26 different variations of TOD, but they're gonna be downtown. This might be a question also for, for Donna. Uh, here in the Bay Area, uh, one of our BART stops is the Fruitvale, which is sort of a very well-designed classic TOD development. Lots of community involvement, lots of local small businesses in there. Uh, very developer in there, but, but very well organized around the BART station, but a lot of uh, local business involvement there too. So I would imagine that TOD, it, it's not just a, a big downtown corridor concept, but uh, there's the opportunity to work with local developers, local businesses, even around some of the smaller location. I agree, and uh, Rod told me to be good today, so I'm not gonna be <laughs> contradicting anything he attention. said. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a good girl, like they say, but. I don't necessarily think that TLD is just for urban areas. That's just my concept, and I just put that out there. And I think that what you said, Sean, is absolutely correct. One of the things that was very interesting, uh, dating back, when you came and you had cities come here and say, you know, to the High Speed Rail Authority and to other people, they really saw this as fostering opportunities, and businesses see it that way as well. I mean, you could talk about concessionaires and the like, but, you know, we, we keep talking about this concept, if you build it, they will come, but it is kind of, it has a lot of merit because people are looking for opportunities. When you have developers who are looking at building housing, and a lot of it is this, and this is what I had to argue with other people, and that is, it's a paradigm shift for us. It really is for California. Because when you go back east and you go abroad, you understand that the transportation system in a lot of ways kind of predated a lot of the housing and some of the other things that were going on. But at the same time, if you look at it, these are exciting opportunities. They really are, and they are an opportunity Opportunity and you can't kind of minimize that opportunity in terms of how they foster development. So it could be anything. It can be anything from the shoe shine guy to the concessionaire to a person building a hotel to a person developing an apartment area. And sometimes when you argue this point, people say, why would I want to live next to a transit station? Why would I want that? And some other people say, I would love that. I mean, if I can walk out of my door and get on a line and go forward. I mean, I live downtown Lone Beach. I just walk down the block, and I get on the blue line, I go downtown. And it's just the most fabulous thing in the world. I mean, <laughs> so you can think about the environment and all the benefits, but I think TLD is something that quite frankly gets misunderstood. I quite frankly do. I think that when you listen to people and you hear people talk about it, it has all kinds of definitions. It really does. But at the end of the day, it is revitalization. Now, Rod is probably talking about something that has real-time statistics maybe real-time statistics in terms of how people think about things. But I just read an article, and I'm going to challenge you on this, where people started saying that people are moving away from urbanism. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, that was a big deal in my day. It's like urbanism, urbanism. And people are looking at living outside, and they like the quality of life to a certain extent, but they also want the conveniences of transportation. So to your point and to your question, I really think that TLD is very important. I think TLD is the one thing that, in my mind, connects the general public and all the business people to a project of this magnitude. So we have time for maybe one last question. There's actually two that, that lump together here. Uh, one, I think, from a skeptic. Uh, how can you claim a train is profitable when you ignore the construction costs? Uh, Second question is, well, the cost to construct high-speed rail uh, are easy to quote by opponents in a time of tight budgets especially. Uh, 
Do you think the ben economic benefits in terms of surrounding business productivity should, I'd say, or could be better quantified to offset the cost concerns? And it, that's actually an issue that's come up in our organization lately. Uh, when we look at the local opposition for very specific local reasons on the peninsula, uh, those aren't construction cost concerns, there are other local concerns, but uh, maybe not as well a job has been done as might be done to actually quantify some of the other upside benefits. So does anybody want to address the construction cost question or the opportunity to quantify the uh, upside benefits? Well, um, given that we're in construction now, um, what I'd like to say on that issue is that for the most part, the, the monies that we have um, to build the project, the phase one, the 1.6 billion that we have now, they're in the form of grants. And um, it's crucially important that a project is not delayed and that we build as quickly as we can. Because over time, if a project costs you know, four billion, the longer we wait, the more those construction costs increase and the more infeasible it becomes to build the project. So I think that's critical to keep in mind um, to get to building and get the processes and the environmental phase done as quickly as possible. Uh, we've benefited from the um, economic um, situation, interestingly enough, in that our bids have come in a lot lower than we had anticipated, and it's helped us move the project forward and ahead um, because you know jobs have been tight and so forth. We've been able to um, get everything under the engineer's estimate to date, so we've been very fortunate. So. I think, you know, you just got to, projects, speaking from somebody who is in construction now, you got to move them as quickly as possible before it becomes too late because the grants, the $150 million, for example, that we have from one of our um, uh, funding partners in Bridge Tolls isn't going to be $150 million in, you know, in five years. And, you know, with escalation costs and so forth, it's critical you move as quickly as you can. So that's just from our perspective being in construction. Jim. I think the broader issue is no major capital transportation projects, well, that's not true, there are some toll roads privately constructed now, but generally, if you go back to the Transcontinental Railroad, uh, Abraham Lincoln signed laws that allowed for the gift, gifting of federal lands in trade-offs for the free right-of-way and parcel sales back to the railroads for the cost of building the Transcontinental Railroads and, and, and the bulk of the railroad system in America was built that way. The highway system, our airports, our ports are built as government uh, partnerships with private entities. And that's the vision for high-speed rail in California as well. So before Bloss closes us out, we have more questions, some very good ones. I'd encourage you to speak to our panelists after we, we end. Uh, Denise would like to make an announcement. Yeah, just uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, ju just to mention, you have been um, given a flyer. Um, a website has been created, California Connect, which is a public platform for research and information about the project. Um, it will have a direct link with um, the website with all the presentations you have seen uh, during those two days and will be expanded um, when a new contribution will arrive from uh, various universities. Uh, and if I may, I may be a little out of my role here, um, but I would like also to praise and thank uh, Blas uh, for having uh, thought about this uh, event and uh, himself and his whole team uh, who have been very, very dedicated to make this happen and be the success it has been. So if we can have a round of applause for him as a team. <laughs> I'd like to thank all of our panel for really being outstanding. You've got a, a terrific set of experts here. And as I, I think about this conversation about high-speed rail and our experience in the Bay Area, it, it's hard not to think about BART, which is about 50 years old, at least when people started to talk about it. And uh, at the time it was conceived of as a region-wide system, it doesn't serve all the counties now. It doesn't go down into San Mateo County beyond the airport. It doesn't go to San Jose quite yet. It doesn't go where I live in Marin. I would love to hop on that thing in Marin County and go downtown and avoid the Golden Gate Bridge traffic on weekends. I think a lot of folks in Silicon Valley would love to get on a BART, but by now it's awfully, yeah. hmm? soon. soon it's coming, partway anyway. But uh, it's really expensive to do it now. A lot of folks think, wow, if we had done that 30, 40 years ago, uh, wouldn't it be great to have today? But it does take some vision uh, beyond the near-term difficulties and costs, uh, but uh, the payoff can be very, very large. So with that, thanks to all of our panel. We'll give it over to Bloss to wrap things up.
Well, uh, I guess uh, we reach our final destination of this uh, intellectual ride, analyzing the vision of high-speed rail here in California. And uh, it's clear that uh, we would like to maximize all the opportunities that this system could provide. It is also clear that there's still some blurry aspects that we need to keep analyzing and working on. And uh, I hope this uh, forum presented uh, uh, interdisciplinary perspective and from different groups, different inter uh, academics, stakeholders, uh, people who are working in the project. And I think this type of mi mixed uh, approach to the analysis can contribute to, to improve the, the project ambition. And with that, I'd like to thank the audience, uh, remind you that for your loyalty, we have a gift for you with all the presentations in a flash drive. Uh, please pick it up before you leave. Uh, also, I'd like to thank all of our panelists, our moderators, um, as well as our co-sponsors, uh, the IURD here at Berkeley, uh, Spur, Transform, and Sincef, as well as uh, my co-chair, Betty Deakin, and uh, as uh, Denise mentioned, well, my very able team, Gambai, Nadia Rassi, Jason Barbos, and Ashley Park. And with that, thank you very much.